Please help me welcome Najwa Zabian. I'm really excited about this. Please give a warm welcome to my dear friend, Ms. Najwa Zabian. Please welcome to the stage, Najwa Zabian. Give it up, guys. Give it up for her. Give it up. I want you to imagine your worries and burdens as mountains. How heavy are they? Lift them off your shoulders, lift them off your heart, and start climbing. That's what I did. And when I ask you what's your story, your story is not what happened to you. Your story is who it made you become. Your story is not how they broke you. Your story is how you put yourself back together and stitched your pieces with gold. Your story is not how they silenced, mistreated, bullied, or judged you or took advantage of you. Your story is how you gave yourself a voice. Your story is your ability to look someone in the eye and feel their pain. It's your empathetic heart, your kind soul. So if I asked you today, what's your story? What will you say? Since a very young age, I was in search of a home. Not a physical home with a roof and windows and doors but a home that felt like my soul could be at peace and I could be who I am unapologetically without waiting for somebody to tell me I love you, without waiting for somebody to tell me I'm gonna listen to you at the end of the day. I've been searching for that home. As a child, I was born, in, born and raised in Lebanon, spent 16 years of my life there. When I hit the age of eight, my mom and dad started traveling back and forth to Lebanon to live with my brothers and sisters who were either pursuing school at the time or something else. They just wanted to live in Canada because that's where they were born. I was the only one born in Lebanon. So my parents would leave for extended periods of time and they would leave me at an uncle's house or an aunt's house or sister's or grandma or whatever it was. So between the age of eight to 16, I lived in probably 10 different homes. I was bullied for being too sensitive. Uh, I was bullied for being too vulnerable, for being too honest, too kind. And I started building up walls. I started guarding myself. I started not allowing people into my life, not because I was looking at them and thinking, you know, you might hurt me, but because I honestly believed that I didn't deserve to be welcomed into other people's lives. So this struggle to feel like somebody genuinely cared about me defined my early years. At the age of 13, a friend of mine gave me a gift for my birthday. And it was a handmade journal. She had cut out several journals, put them on top of each other, glued them, put an old pair of jeans, and said, this is yours. And the first time I sat with my journal and wrote in it, it was so uncomfortable, but I came back to it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Because there was a certain level of comfort and home in that journal that I'd never experienced before. And looking back, I know it's because my journal never said, you shouldn't feel that way. My journal never said, you're too sensitive, or you deserve to be treated that way, or if an adult did it, that's okay. My journal listened, and it was just me. This is how I'm feeling today. This is what happened today. That was my listener. That was my friend. Fast forward three years, I fly to Canada to visit my family over the summer, and the war breaks out in Lebanon. This was in 2006. So now I'm in this brand new place where I do speak English, but it's not the language that I got used to communicating with people with. And everybody is looking at me as an outsider, which I was. At the time, if you saw the picture that was on the screen, it's not up now, I used to cover, I used to wear a hijab. And when I arrived in Canada, I was very aware of how different I was. But to be honest, I didn't care because that wasn't my biggest concern. My biggest concern was feeling 
like I belonged here, like I had a place. And having that as the struggle of my whole life, coming to a brand new place, it just felt like I didn't want to feel anymore. Because feeling was so painful. Writing meant that I was feeling. Opening up my journal meant that I was looking at all these pages that I had written about all the dreams and promises that I promised my older self that I couldn't achieve. So I ripped up my journal and said I'm never writing again at 16. One night, during one of my hardest times, my dad pulled up a picture of me when I was this small. I was holding his hand very tightly, and he said, you know, when I was holding your hand in that picture, I looked in your eyes and I thought, this girl is going places. And when I look at you now, I don't see that look in your eyes. So I went to my room that night and I looked in the mirror, and he was right. I was looking at a person that no longer resembled me. I looked. And I described this before the same way, like a sky choking on clouds, not knowing whether to rain or be sunny or be clear. I looked like I was choking. And in that moment, I decided not to give up on myself now like I gave up on myself when I was, when I was 16. This time, I wrote. I wrote about my pain. I wrote about it, and as hard as it was, it healed me. The deeper I went into my pain, the higher I rose in courage, the higher I rose in proud pride of who I am, being proud of who I am, turning your pain into something beautiful, turning it into nectar instead of turning it into bitterness or coldness. That has given me so much conviction in the fact that our world needs more people who are not afraid to be human, not afraid to be vulnerable, not afraid to show who they are, not afraid to take risks, not afraid to stand in front of the world and raise their voice and say, this is what happened to me and this is how I overcame it. And so one night this revelation came to me. These mountains that you are carrying, you were only supposed to climb. These mountains that you are carrying, you were only supposed to climb. Thank you.